Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Today, we're going to use a laser sensor, a $2 microcontroller, and some Wi-Fi's to build the ultimate remote driveway security sensor. You see, I'm out in the country and my driveway is some 300 feet long, and I want to know when someone is pulling into the head of that driveway. Now, for years, we've had a remote motion sensor about a third of the way down, about at the limit of its range, and it, in turn, triggers the perimeter motion systems that are announced in the house. It's in part so that I can hear it, but more importantly, the dogs can hear it. Whereas I might have lowered my guard by now to assume that the UPS guy isn't a cleverly disguised intruder, the dogs still aren't so sure. And so when they hear the buzzer, they immediately check it out and go crazy when it's someone they don't recognize. And sure enough, it works, and the UPS guy leaves each and every day without breaking in, so the dogs get that reinforcement of a job well done, I guess. But even now, they know the different buzzes made by the different sensors around the property. They know which window to look out automatically. There are actually three base stations for the sensor. One upstairs, one downstairs, and one out here in the shop. Each announce is in its area, so when the base station out here in the shop inexplicably quit working a week or so ago, I stopped getting driveway alerts in the shop. The security systems are all actually tied into the interior sensors, but the notification was still a convenience that I missed out in the shop, so I had to fix it or replace it. And try as I might, I was not able to fix it. It further turns out that the base units I've had for about 15 years now are no longer made, and worse, no one seems to make one similar these days. An RF receiver with a normally open contact relay that gets triggered in the base station when the remote motion sensor is activated. Having the base station close a relay is how the alarm panel and home automation find out about the event, so it's an important feature for me. It's how the floodlights get turned on automatically, for example, or at least it used to be. Since nobody seems to make one, I decided to make my own. So I sat down and made my feature wish list, and here's what I came up with. First, I wanted a laser or LED beam system, not an infrared motion sensor. The passive IR sensors are okay for people and animals and even most vehicles, but they struggle to notice things with a low heat signature like a Tesla. I also wanted it to have a sensitivity adjustment so that it wouldn't trigger if just a leaf blew by. Next, I needed it to transmit the event to the shop somehow because I wasn't about to run 200 feet of new cabling. That means RF of some kind, and it turns out that 2.4 GHz Wi-Fi is good for a maximum of about 300 feet outdoors. Thus, I decided I would go Wi-Fi. There's also an alternate technology called LoRa that has even longer range, but I was betting that I was within the required range. Finally, I needed it to integrate into my home automation system. Almost all of my automated devices are Insteon, but I've always run local controller software so it's not on the cloud, and thus I wasn't impacted when Insteon's cloud service went away. But I still have all the devices. The local software I've been running for almost 20 years now runs only on the Mac, but it was the best software I could find 20 years ago, so I've always kept at least one Mac around to run the automation. Now it runs on a dedicated Mac Mini connected to a UPS and the Insteon transceiver. The goal was that when the beam was tripped at the driveway entrance, something would connect over Wi-Fi and send a message to the Indigo software. And that software will run an event that does things like announce motion in the shop and turn on the driveway spotlights. That something will be a little ESP32 module. I got one on Amazon from Helltech, and it's known as the Wi-Fi Kit 32 V3. The plan was to connect the sensor's contact relay to ground and an input pin on the ESP32, and the software would monitor for that closure and then connect via Wi-Fi and transmit the event to the Indigo server. We'll see the code later, but for now, let's have a look at the overall design. The driveway sensor will live at the end of the driveway. It shoots a beam of light across the driveway to a prismatic reflector that sends it right back to the sensor, where an optical receiver senses that the beam is complete. When a person or vehicle breaks that beam, the sensor notices immediately and closes the contact relay. That relay connects an input pin and ground on the ESP32. The ESP32, which maintains a Wi-Fi connection to my IoT network, notices the closure is active and it sends what is essentially a curl web request off to the Indigo web service. The web service, once activated, plays a WAV file on the shop speakers, notifies the alarm panel, and then turns on the driveway lights by sending command packets over a mesh network that controls all of the lighting switches. It's just complicated enough that Mr. Goldberg would indeed be pleased, but the rest of the pipeline has been reliable for decades, so I figured all I needed to do was tap into it. I'll put a link to everything in the video description. And speaking of links in the video description, bear with me for 15 seconds from our sponsor, me. I've just published my new book intended for people that don't have an autism diagnosis, but who suspect they might be somewhere on the spectrum. It's called The Non-Visible Part of the Autism Spectrum, and the link to an exclusive and extensive free sample is in the video description. 
It's everything I know now about living a successful life on the spectrum that I wish I'd known long ago. Now, back to our sensor. The LED beam supports a range of up to 35 feet and is powered by a very flexible power circuit that can accept DC from 12 to 240 volts or AC from 24 to 240. You just connect it without worrying about polarity or AC-DC and it figures out the rest and just works, which I thought was pretty cool. I need more of that kind of power supply in my life. You position the sensor itself on one side of the driveway and you place the retro-reflective mirror on the other side, which means no wires have to cross the driveway, which can be a big deal. As long as you get some kind of power to the unit itself, that's all you need. The retro-reflector is very much like a bicycle or roadside reflector. There's a really good episode of Technology Connections on them, and I'll try to link to that, but what makes them amazing is that they are composed of numerous little inverted mirror pyramids, meaning no matter what angle the light beam comes in, it is reflected directly back to the sensor in a fully reflected ray. That way, as long as the beam strikes the reflector, it will come directly back to the sensor just below it. The ESP32 module is a lot less flexible when it comes to power, and it expects a regulated 5 volt input to either one of the power pins or to the USB-C connector. I went with the latter since I had a 120 volt supply nearby that I could simply plug a simple USB charger into. I was a little skittish about tapping the sensor directly into 120 volts, so I wound up using a 20 volt power brick instead for the sensor itself. I'm much too good looking to die over a driveway sensor electrocution accident. The next step was to connect the sensor to the ESP32 module. And here's where I made a bit of a mistake that you can learn from. Because I was bench testing it as I was coding it, I used pin 0 as my input since it's connected to a convenient button right on the Helltech module. That enabled me to get the code working and reacting to the button press as if it were a contact closure without actually worrying about the sensor for now. The only catch is that pin 0 is also a bootstrapping pin on the ESP32, meaning that if your sensor is triggered while you turn on the power into the ESP32, it will try to enter chip flashing mode instead. So long story short, even if you use pin 0 for testing, pick a different pin like pin 5 as your actual input pin when you wire and deploy it. The sensor has about 6 feet of multi-conductor wiring coming out of it, and the wiring is quite straightforward. Blue and brown are the power inputs, and black and white are the contact closure wires that get connected to the ESP32. There's also one more wire that is normally closed, so you're also covered if you're working with a circuit that needs you to break rather than make a connection. But in my case, I just taped that one off. I placed the power connections and the Helltech module inside of a plastic waterproof case. I just assumed the plastic was the way to go here since I needed the Wi-Fi to work, and I'm happy to report that it connects reliably each and every time from about 200 feet away. The sensor is mounted to a sturdy pole, and the Helltech enclosure sits where it has a fairly clean line of sight to the wireless access point. Now what about the code on the ESP32 to monitor the input and do the Wi-Fi connection and transmit to the web service? I've put the code on GitHub for anybody who wants to replicate my results, and so I'll just give you a quick tour of the highlights here. Hopefully, even if you can't read code, you'll then get a sense for how it works. Every Arduino-based project, ESP32 or otherwise, has two important functions in the code that you must provide. The first is called setup, and it's called one time when the chip starts up to do your one-time initialization. Then it calls the loop function you provide, repeatedly and forever, and that's where you do your ongoing work. Taking a look at our setup code, it initializes the serial port for logging, and then it clears the Heltec OLED screen sets the rotation, and draws some status text. Next, we have a button class object, predictably called button. This class handles debouncing the button, which is important with a relay. That's because even though the relay is slammed shut by a magnet internally, it still might bounce a bit and wind up closing several times instead of just once. The class uses interrupts and a timer to sort that out for us. Next, we connect to the Wi-Fi, and we loop until we're successful at doing it because there's nothing that this particular program can accomplish without a connection, so we might as well wait. Once we have Wi-Fi, we return out of setup, and our loop code will run. Inside the loop code, I clear the screen and print a message that indicates I'm waiting for the button press, which is going to be the contact closure of the relay. If and when the relay closes, the button will register as being pressed, and will draw the word pressed on the screen before calling a function called send action request. That's the function that will actually connect to the Indigo service and report the driveway motion. The code for this function checks to make sure we're still connected to the Wi-Fi, and if we are, it composes an HTTP request. The request contains a lengthy authorization token for access control, and it is posted to the web server URL. The form of the request is going to be different for every type of automation software, and it will even vary depending on what action you're causing it to take. 
On the server side, we have an event called Announce Driveway Motion, and this is the event that's going to be invoked by the ESP32's web request. We can see in this test setup, it just does two things. It turns on the driveway spotlights, and it plays a wave file of intruder alert via the Mac in the shop, which is connected to the room speakers. And that's it. It works great and has been dead solid reliable so far. Now remember, I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so if you found today's episode to be any combination of entertaining or informative, I'd be honored if you'd leave me one of each before you go today. And if you're already subscribed, thank you. And thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime, and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.